Hello, my name is Michael O'Keefe, a.k.a. The Movie List. If you enjoy this interview and want to hear more top-notch film industry conversations, please press the thumbs up, subscribe to this channel, and hit the bell to stay in the know. Hello, Francesco Giannini. Please tell my yes. why they might enjoy your accidentally prophetic horror movie, All. <laughs> oh, well, first of all, I mean, uh, you know, it is a pandemic virus film, so it's a pretty mm -hmm. hot topic, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, which was a complete coincidence. Uh, we shot this film in January, so um, to to have it uh, come, you know, uh, be released during a time of pandemic ourselves, it's 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 really it's mind mind blowing. You know, uh, never would I expect it uh, for this to happen. Uh, so yeah, I think it's it's an interesting film for that reason. I mean, it's it gives you some insight on, you know, uh, the, myself, the writer's perspective on how we see you know, virus spreads and pandemics. And of course, it's a little bit exaggerated like any other sci-fi horror films, but the idea and the themes are there. Uh, they're prominent in today's society and what's going on. So I think it's an interesting film for that purpose. And I think that's why people will be intrigued by it. And that's what's what, why it's been so intriguing so far uh, for people to, just watching the trailer. I mean, it is a pretty uh, <laughs> prominent topic today's uh, news every day, right? So, yeah. It's funny. Yeah. It's just it, the marketing did itself, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> never, never in a million years you can expect something of this of this type of marketing in the world. Like you can never, you can never plan for something like this. This is, uh, yeah, it's it's such a it's a blessing, but it's such a you know, this it's disappointing times for sure. It's devastating the the, the whole situation. But on, on a marketing and business level, of course, it's it's positive for us just because of the the the, the themes of the film, the story itself. You know, it's so it's fitting to what's going on. So for that, it's, it's great. But in another way, of course, it's, it's not the best time for everybody, right? It is devastating. So. Oh yeah. yes. Oh yes. Yeah. So I, I don't know what you're like with the references. Like, I don't know. Like I, I like to think sometimes if I, if I pitch a movie, it's just for yeah. someone to watch, I'll be like, it's this movie by the way of this movie. So if you, yeah. had, I don't know, like, I don't know how, like, if, if, if you like doing that, but please indulge me. If you had to say, <laughs> Hall uh, is like one movie by the way of another movie. Which ones would you pick? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it does have a lot of inspirations. You know, uh, the film itself, uh, if I want to just say a few films, you know, a few filmmakers that inspired me over the years. But in terms of what you can feel in the film uh, when you watch Hall, there's definitely a mix of, um, you know, Orson Welles and, uh, uh, you know, Hitchcock, uh, Stanley Kubrick has been, you know, huge inspiration. So, you know, of course, in the modern day horror, like films like Saw. So I would say, you know, a mix of, of Saw, you know, meets The Shining. Uh, you know, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's tough to say, but it's got a little bit a touch of the old school filmmaking, filmmaking style and aesthetic with a little bit of modern touch. That's what's interesting about the film. It's fun because it's got a thriller aspect but it has a mixture of genres you know there's a little bit of gore there's a little bit of sus there's sus the suspense thrill uh there's some uh you know uh hallucinations and haunting so it's got a mm. mix of of um you know of, of of genres within in the horror let's say in the horror world so yeah. yeah i would say there's a little bit of cronenberg in there as well i'm a big fan of cronenberg and some of his films from the 80s the fly was a big film for me Ooh. uh inspiration so you can still you can feel a little bit of that but i would say uh, yeah maybe the shining meets you know saw uh you know and I, I think phone booth was also a film in terms of genre not of course outside of the genre but in terms mm -hmm. of contained location and keeping someone intrigued and and into the story and, and the suspense build up like a, a film like phone booth was mm -hmm. definitely an inspiration in there as well uh in terms of structure but yeah so uh it, it definitely has a mix of, of uh inspirations in terms of films and how you can you can see you can you can pinpoint them while you watch it uh, i was yeah. getting sort of from the trailer uh, uh david cronenberg's uh shivers vibe is yeah that, yeah is that anything yeah. to you yeah yeah, well, definitely, because I, I, I kind of worked on a documentary uh, in 2017 uh, called The Tax Shelter Era. Oh, oh cool. Tax Shelter Terrors. Yeah, so we yeah. worked on, we, we, we interviewed some of these uh, producers from back in the day, right? And mm -hmm. um, so these are from the, from the 70s, 80s, the Tax Shelter Era, when films were being made on, you know, uh, there was a massive explosion of Canadian, you know, genre mm -hmm. uh, exploitation films. And 
that's and definitely Cornerberg is part of that era. And that's when that's where he all started. That's where he got his break. Right. So working on those films and those interviews, I got to, you know, um, kind of go investigate some of their work. So definitely subconsciously, definitely there's some of his of inspiration in there. Absolutely. You know, Rabbit and, uh, you know, Shivers. There's so much in there for sure. And, and, and you know, like I said, I mean, um, as a, it's, I'm proud as a Canadian filmmaker to definitely be you know when i have people talking about hall and getting and spotting some of those uh references cross references to those films or inspirations you can t- you can you can tell that's it's really an honor it's great to, to see that because they're definitely influential filmmakers to me so oh that's yeah. awesome great yeah, yeah yeah lots of great work by cronenberg i'm a big fan myself uh yeah. and, and you mentioned hitchcock and this is a horror movie you know he's the master of suspense yeah. and uh, yeah. i was wondering um you know, what, what, what are you, what are you, some of your favorite films by uh, The Master of Suspense? Well, you see, for me, Hitchcock, like I, I've, I learned about Hitchcock very much into, in film theory and film school. Mm-hmm. Um, growing up, I wasn't a big fan of oldies film, yeah. uh, films. You know, mm-hmm. I, I grew up in the, in the 80s watching, you know, Fright Night, The Fly, and, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm from the 80s generation. So that's, that's the introduction of horror I got. I only got touched, started touching these iconic filmmakers in film school and um you know in terms of let's say Hitchcock of course Psycho and there's definitely there's definitely elements of his work that I've always touched me and I think Hitchcock Mm -hmm. for me was was more on the aesthetic level you know uh example I'll give an example in terms of let's say um uh vertigo shots you know type of vertigo shots Uh, you know you'll, you'll have a feel of that it's an old school technique, but it's effective. And if you touch it, you, you try to incorporate it in a modern day film, you know, you got to do it aesthetically nice that it works and it doesn't feel too offbeat or off, you know, or cheesy, let's say, you know, and um, I think his aesthetic work, you know, such so, so the, the simplicity of it was, was so effective in his films, you know, and to create that suspense. So that's what I kind of got from Hitchcock's films. And when I mentioned, um, you know, a lot of the uh, Orson Welles and up the first time, I started watch when I started watch, when I saw his films was when I was kind of getting introduced to uh, diopter shots, which was, you know, double focused and, and, mm. and they have, you know, they have, they definitely have meaning when you put them in a story and, and within hall, uh, I use a diopter shot and that was, that comes from, you know, Citizen Kane and some older films. So um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's always hard to pinpoint where the inspiration came from, but yeah. definitely those guys are in there and I, I, it's almost like a tribute, you know, even just the main actress, the, uh, People are getting, you know, when we casted her, like we knew right away, oh yeah, this is the poltergeist girl. You know, everybody was, <laughs> was making references and we knew yeah. that was going to happen. And, and it was subconsciously done. So, it, you know, it was like there's a, you know, there was definitely an influence there. The eighties, that's, I was watching poltergeist. I was petrified uh, by that film. So it's really hard, but my introduction to film came from the horror world. So, you know, like I started, like besides the horror films from the eighties, I was watching action films like Rambo and, and, and uh-huh. <laughs> of course, and that, so, so I had that side of, uh, of, of introduction to film, but the horror was really my introduction to the film industry, you know, and as much as I'm interested in different genres, that was the initiation. So, this, so there's a lot of filmmakers and a lot of inspiration in there from a lot of iconic, uh, uh, you know, filmmakers. So, so many yeah. good horror movies, especially in that period, the 70s yeah. and 80s. It's the yeah. best. It was, it was. Like I, like I said, I'm, an eight, I'm born in the 80s and... Yeah. Uh, so I got to see those 80s films growing up. For me, like films like even, I'm not saying necessarily even horror, like Ghostbusters was one of the films that really, you know, mm-hmm. uh, marked me as a filmmaker. That was one of the films that like, wow, I want to make movies. <laughs> uh, you know, Fright Night and, and uh, like The Fly. And yeah, yeah there, there was definitely some iconic films there. I could, there could be a list, like I don't have them on top, yeah. of, my, top, on top of my head, but definitely that's what really, really, um, inspired me and uh, got me going. So I, I, I always told myself when I, when I pursued, when I started pursuing the career that I wanted to go back and explore these uh, uh, horror film, the horror genre itself and, and really, uh, you know, create some, some, some interesting and unique work. I think Hall for me was something that I wanted to be unique in its own way, you know? Um, and a lot of people are actually making reference to it when they see the trailer that it's a zombie flick, but realistically it, it's not an, a zombie flick. It was, it was never meant to be a zombie flick, but it's interesting to see the reactions of people because they're uncertain, which is good. Mm. It, creates about, it creates an interest and, and, and people are intrigued. But um, yeah, so there's definitely a lot of uh, 80s inspiration in there for sure. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah. Well, we could do a stream of consciousness list off every movie that you've ever enjoyed. But uh, yeah. we, we mentioned your, the time period 
where you started watching these movies. And I want to go to geography now. What what are okay. the rewards and challenges of being Montreal based? So, what are the rewards and challenges of being a Montreal based filmmaker? You mean? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a very good question. No one's ever asked me that, but I, I definitely have an answer for that. So, okay. Let's start with let's let's start with the let's start with the challenges. Let's start with sure. the challenges. Um, the challenges is that, and, and we're talking locally. Uh, are we talking locally Montreal or Canada? Let's start. Let's do local. Local. Okay. So yeah. local. So local. The challenges are that first of all, we come. I, I'm from Quebec, and uh, as you know, Quebec is a French-speaking province, and mm -hmm. I'm a I'm an Italian Canadian <laughs> Anglophone, <laughs> and I speak I speak French very well. So mm -hmm. the industry, the Quebec industry, is very very dominant here in in Montreal. Meaning to say, a lot of content that's produced is either Quebecois French or American service providing projects that come into town, you know, Hollywood films, x Men's, all the big boys come here, which I actually participate in some of those projects. I started as an actor uh, when my career early on, I started as an actor. So I got to get on these big, huge Hollywood sets, which was a great experience and developed my uh, directing career. But that's another story. So, um, yeah. So what happened is th the challenges is that when you're an English Italian filmmaker trying to get funding and trying to get grant money and trying to raise, you know, uh, exp exposure um it's difficult because you know you're you're not you're, you're not in the limelight as the quebecois filmmakers uh, that, that come out of uh, you know that like example the needle nerves and john mark ballets which have, are having successful careers in the u.s but there's a quebec niche market here and if you're it's hard to be part of that market and that's a challenge because you can't break through that market it's very difficult especially with uh, English, English films, you know, uh, and, and of course an Italian <laughs> last name. Mm -hmm. Um, so the challenges are definitely opportunities are hard to come by here. So this is how I had to take opportunity in my own hand and look, seek financing elsewhere for my films. I call my other film coming out called Woodland Gray, which I produced, um, and a few others that I'm developing. So I began ex exploring outside of Quebec, the opportunities, because there's a whole, you know, a whole world of filmmakers out there and, and, and people that are interested to make movies. It's not just here. So the biggest challenge has been to survive here while I'm building my career. Um, the biggest, you know, so that, I, that would say as, as the challenges that I could kind of confront you every day, you know, um, is like example, this film hall, like right now, it's getting a lot of interesting buzz. And majority of the buzz is outside of my home, my own hometown. You know, <laughs> it's either in the UK or the right. US. And so yeah. it's not like the Quebec market is talking about Francesco Giannini making this really cool horror pandemic film. <laughs> I barely there, there's a couple of reviews that came out, very minimal, but not many people speak about it. You know, so hmm. and it's okay. I'm okay with it. So it's right. very hard to get. It's very hard to get on the map uh, and to break through. You know, so that's why I took a route where. I said, let me try and explore other options. And in terms of the, the we talked about the challenges, but let's talk about the rewards. You know, being in Canada is, is, is really, it's a privilege because we do have a lot of tax credits, benefits. We do have a lot of grant applications that you can't find in other countries, you know, or, or in other, you know, like in the U.S., so we have a lot of government support for our projects. It doesn't mean it's easy to get the, the grant supports, but mm -hmm. at least they're, they're available for the filmmakers. Um, and that alone gives us a chance to, to produce content because finding investors is a challenge itself. But if you don't, you have the opportunity of going to get some government money. So there's definitely rewards for that in terms of, you know, opportunity, government support, uh, a lot of great community of filmmakers, creatives, so much talent. Of, there's a pool of, of talent in this town that I've met in terms of directors, DPs, uh, you name it. There's, there's so much. And, and it's, 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 and then you, of course you have successful filmmakers like Denis Villeneuve and Jean-Marc Vallée. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, we're proud. We're, we're, we're proud to have those guys represent us as a country and as a, as a city that they, you know, yeah. they're making big, big Hollywood films. And it's, it gives you, it gives you inspiration and hope that you can do it yourself as a filmmaker. Like I believe, that I, I, I would love to get to that level one day. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and so there's definitely interesting rewards being a Canadian filmmaker. And the other thing is what, what's interesting about being a Canadian filmmaker, and I think this is a very, you know, specific point, maybe in my opinion, but of course, you know, it, a lot of people can relate, is that because there's less money in Canada, 
compared to, let's say, when you might watch films from the U.S. or let's say even other countries, budgets are limit. Budgets are limited here in Canada. Let's 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 not uh, you know let's let's not <laughs> let's be honest. It's it's very sure. difficult to get fin- financing to make films in Canada. But what it teaches you as a filmmaker is to work with low budgets and do high production value. So that's what's rewarding, I find, for filmmakers here is that we have the opportunity to prove what we can do with so little. For example, if I, if, if, if I can make a movie of $5 million look like a $20 million film or whatever, a, you know, big blockbuster, that's mm-hmm. a success. Whereas someone in the States, let's say like a Scorsese, if they don't have the minimum $300 million, they can't make their movie. So, and that's what I think Jean-Marc Vallée and Denis Villeneuve was the key to their success is look what these guys can do with so little. Imagine if you give them a little bit more. So I find that's a reward for me to have come from Canada and Quebec is that because of the, 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 the um, what do you call them? The, uh, the, the difficulties and the challenges of raising funds and, it, it, and, you know, and making films gives you the strength and uh, the, the endurance, the, what do you call it? The, the drive to, to, to try and make something happen with nothing. And yeah. if you can succeed and you could produce something that's interesting, and that looks good and that's presentable, that's a success. So that becomes a reward because it teaches you how to work with restrained budgets and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, limit, limited access to whatever you want to call it, you know, like a cast, uh, like rentals and all that stuff. So um, I think that becomes a reward in the end. So that's what, that's what it's teaching me. For me, Hall was a perfect example. It's a low-budget horror but I'm very proud when I watch it and I say, wow, it definitely doesn't look like the budget I used to make this film. So that's a good, we made a lot of good choices and a good decisions. To, and I think that's a lot of filmmakers from here can gain that. And that's rewarding, I believe, as filmmakers. So, Cool. Yeah. yeah. So in uh, 2018 and 2019, I took a Greyhound and I went to Montreal to cover Fantasia, Fantasia mm-hmm. International Film Festival. And you mm-hmm. had a short film there at, uh, called Flair. And I would love to know about the short and hear about your experience at Fantasia. So, yeah. So, I went to Fantasia a few times, actually, with a couple of shorts over the years that I not only, like, I, I produced a few shorts with some other filmmakers. Oh, okay. So, cool. so I've been a few times. But Flair was one that was really um, a big turning point for me. Uh, why? Because, you know, uh, as a filmmaker... To me, that was a huge, huge challenge, like any other, like any project, of course. But that one in particular, because I invested my own money in this project, and I made it. It was a short slash pilot for a series, and um, I was developing, uh, developing it for a couple of years with a friend of mine, a writer friend of mine, uh, Johan, and um, we said, you know what? I mean, we applied for grant money, we didn't get it. We said, listen, instead of just waiting for money, let's just, I'll put some money of my own money and try and make this film look awesome for, for a smaller budget. And, and it was a great, great success in terms of the, the production value and, and the, the, final, the final product. It looked great. And, uh, um, you know, people were t- commenting on the project and they thought like, when I was sending it out to, to pitch, right, as a, as a series, people were telling me, like, what do you, what'd you have for this? Like 300 for half a million dollars to shoot this? And the reality, the truth is, I only had forty thousand dollars Canadian. Mm-hmm. So when you watch the flare, it's pretty impressive what I did for a sci-fi type of uh, genre with the, with the, the VFX and just the style of the film and, and the story. Um, and and Fantasia picked it up, and it was great. It was great exposure locally. I had about maybe seven hundred people attend the premiere. Wow! Uh, and yeah, yeah, the theater was at the, the Concordia building and it was just oh, yes. jam to jam, huh. jam, jam, jam. And yeah. it was such an honor to see all my friends, family, and just people interested because there was, I was on TV. I did a, an interview on TV for Breakfast Television and I was talking about the film. And, and it was funny because it was right around Blade Runner. And, you know, oh, there's, cool. a lot of, there's a lot of Blade Runner inspiration in that film, even before uh-huh. they even have made the remake, uh, the, yeah. the, the sequel, the sequel, right? So. Mm-hmm. Um, so Fantasia was a great, it's a great festival, a great, a great festival, genre festival. I met so many people and the people that I met at Fantasia are the people I'm talking to today for my film hall and for future projects. So it's definitely a place that really opened up my career in terms of contacts, in terms of connections, in terms of exposure of my work and people knowing what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, so the flair is a big part because it was a flair was a, was like going from shorts to medium features, you know, kind of, because it was a half an hour pilot. So it was like a training oh. for me to really 
to yeah, it became a, it was a short film of twenty seven minutes, but we also pitched it as a as a series, like an episode one. Right. Um, yeah. So it was tough. It didn't do well. It didn't get much recognition in other festivals, but from what I understand, the reactions were that it was too long of a short uh, for other festivals. From some of the feedback I got, but it didn't matter. The point is, is that we were happy that we executed and we premiered in our hometown, which was really nice. And uh, yeah, so that's that was a great experience, I have to say. And it opened up a lot of doors for what we're doing today on, on these new projects. Yeah. That's awesome. Sounds like doors yeah. opened up. It did. It did. It did. Definitely. Good. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's shift, back, uh, let's shift gears back into Hall. So okay. as a director, what, what, mm-hmm. what, what tone do you like to strike um, with your actors and crew? Tone, meaning, when you say tone, meaning, are we talking about On the... Set. Yeah, right. Like what? Like what kind of demeanor do you uh, do do projects into into people's minds and hearts? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I'm I'm. <laughs> so first thing is when I make when I'm making uh, you know I I definitely have um, as a filmmaker I have prior you know I have I put a lot of attention and energy on a, different departments right I mean yeah. making a low budget film. To have a good execution, you need to have good cast, you need to have good cinematography, you need to have good sound, you need to have good art direction. So I put a lot of energy on those those departments prior to shooting. So a lot of preparation and development and pre-production goes in before we shoot because we have limited days. I shot Hall in 12 days, you know, (laughs) that's, that's nothing for a feature. So, I mean, people do it and, and, and to do in order to do it, you need to be well organized. So beforehand, I have a lot of meetings with my heads of departments and I'm very, very laid back with my team and these are friends of mine and we're chill and it's not like a dictatorship on set. It's a family. For me, it's all about family and leadership. I've been a leader all my life and everything I do in my life in terms of sports. I have, I'm a leader of my softball team. I'm a leader of my baseball uh, hockey team. So it's by nature. It's in my, it's in my genetics and you know, I do my best to lead and, and be a great leader. And of course there's times where, I get pissed off and I'm angry right, right. if things are not, if things are not going my way. Sure. But never to the, never to the point of disrespecting people. And, and, and I think the more you treat people, you know, well and, and show them respect, the more effort and work, hard work they're going to give you. And I noticed yeah. that everybody that we selected, a majority of the people were such, such great human beings and, and so proud to be part of the project that they gave their heart and soul. And when I see that, it's just full chemistry and full, you know, connection. And everybody, now we stay friends. And we worked on two films back to back, which was great. So we shot one and then we shot another all together. I brought back 90% of the crew. So wow. it, for, for me, a loyalty is important. I would work with the same people the whole time, as much as I can, if mm-hmm. I could, if it's possible. But, you know, there's circumstances. People have other jobs. They get other jobs. and you sure. know. But it doesn't always work like that. For me, I'm a perfectionist. So if I see things are you know, things, people are working hard and putting the effort. I'm very happy. If I see people that are slacking off and, you know, and then I'll, I'll, I'll definitely get angry and I'll definitely have things to say. And maybe I won't work with those people again because we're so limited on financing. We're so limited on time. We need strong, effective creatives and workers to, 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 to execute the job. Because if they don't, the, the film fails. Every department has such an important element to the final product in terms of sound and and and, and just on set management and mm-hmm. all the all the details right so but i would say if, if you would ask the guy uh, the team how it is to work with me i would think it would be hopefully positive because i think mm-hmm. it was always smiling and laughing even in stressful moments we were so well organized that it was never there was never really a stressful moment the calendar the schedule was very well prepared and we executed our tasks accordingly so um, yeah, and my cast, yeah, cast, I gave them a lot of freedom. I gave them a lot of freedom, meaning I, I worked with them on the script prior to shooting. So we sat down, we had some phone calls, we talked about the characters, how did they see the characters, how did they feel about the characters, and they, they gave me their input of how they saw things. We did a couple of rewrites that made sense to the story. Um, I really gave a lot of freedom. So every time we would do a new, sorry, a new scene, you know, we would, discuss it and figure out if there's anything that we can do to better the story, better the, 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 the dialogue or the scene itself. And the characters really, the actors really trusted me in that way. And I saw that they kind of uh, understood 
the challenges of this type of shoot of 12 days, they give their heart and they really committed to it. And, you know, working with Julian Richings was, was such a great honor and Carolina and, and all of them, Mark, um, you know, and, and I think one of the comments I got from them was that they said that I really knew one of the comments, which was really, was really nice was that I was an actor's director, meaning, you know, I kind of really knew what it is to be in their shoes. And why is that is because I, al I also worked as an actor. So my initial career started as an actor in, in, in 2005. And I did about five, six, seven years working on sets, doing auditions. So that really helped develop the, the actor director uh, skill, you know, we'll be able to talk to actors and being in their shoes and understanding their, 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 uh, you know, their job. So, um, yeah, I think it was a great connect chemistry with everybody. There was never any tension. Um, I think there was maybe one moment where there was difficulties, um, just a misunderstanding because we were working with a Japanese actress. So the truth mm -hmm. you know, working with the translators, sometimes yeah. it was difficult to kind of translate. So that was, that would probably be the biggest challenges, but we still managed to get through cause she was a warrior. Yumiko, so. uh -huh. oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah I've, done in, I've done interviews with translators. I know, uh, things, things could not go great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. so, okay. Uh, how integral do you believe a good score is in a horror movie? Well, you know, um, music or like, yeah, the sound and music of a film, mm -hmm. a horror yeah. film, right. it's, 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 of course it's crucial, but it's also crucial the way you use it. And sometimes scenes and films are, are just as scary and suspenseful without it. So it's about mm -hmm. the direction and how you use it. Because a film could be just as scary mm -hmm. as a film that has full score in it and full music, jump scares, and uh, with films that have none. Just mm. the silence itself will build that suspense. So it's about how it's used, not necessarily that you have to necessarily use the score to make something scary. It's how you use it, even if there is none. That's how I see it. So less, to me, to me I'm, I'm the type of filmmaker, well, especially for Hall, in relation to Hall, I'm trying to build something right now with the score where it's because we're still not we're just doing some fine tuning for yeah. the final. Um, you know, less is more. Less mm -hmm. is more. You know, if you give it too much in people's face, then it's over the top. It's over exaggerated. You're not building that suspense. So there's strategic ways I find that scoring a film is important to to be able to execute. But I think of course it's it's crucial for a Hall in relation to the Hall. I believe 50% of the success of the film is going to be on sound design and ambiance and score together, you know, um, yeah. just because it's a, it's a, it's a feeling, it's a moody film. It's a feel, a movie of, 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 <clears throat> of uh, what do you call it? Uh, a feeling basically. Yeah. Cause you need to, you need to feel, you need to hear it. It's an experience, right? You're crawling, you're, you're with the, with the characters trying to crawl out of this, this hallway for 90 minutes or whatever, 85 minutes mm -hmm. because, you know, so, it, it was built like an experience. And I think the sound really, really um, supports that, supports that story element to, to be able to execute it. So for this film, absolutely, it's important. And I'm trying my best to balance it enough where it's not over the top and it's not too little. It's just enough and just right. All right. Well, yeah. Francesco, it's been a very interesting conversation. I really appreciate it. No problem. It's been a well, pleasure. Thank you for having me. My pleasure yeah. as well. Uh, before I let you go, uh, yeah. may you please tell my audience what you have planned for the rest of the year. Yeah, okay, so um, my my plans right now is to definitely finish Hall, uh, to get you know get Hall into the festivals and mm -hmm. um, see where that goes. Um, I am releasing another film that I produced under my company called Woodland Gray, uh, director Adam Adam Ryder friend of mine old friend of mine and uh, we're releasing that film in the next few months as well it's in post-production so that's come that's going to be in the works there's definitely a, some sequels to hall by the way i don't want to give too much away but oh we built we did build hall in a way that we have some <laughs> it's a world <laughs> a little, it's a world it's a world huh. it's not one it's, a, it's not a one movie off it's it's definitely uh -huh. a world uh, so yeah so i'm really excited to see where that goes but that's something in the works of course i did sign up a, a deal for another feature film to be shot in Vancouver next year uh, with a, a company in Vancouver, a uh, script that I had uh, optioned off a great writer from, from Ontario, um, Joel Buxton. I don't know if that says anything to you, but um, it's a film called Limo. Limo. So, <coughs> limo. 90 per, limo, like limousine. 
Got it. Yeah, so the film takes place uh, in a, 80% of the film takes place in a limousine. So, <laughs> Jesus, wow. Yeah, and it's very, 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 very fun script, very fun story, very intriguing. I mean, just like, you know, just me telling you 80% of the film is going to be the limo, how are we going <laughs> to keep the audience intrigued, right? Yeah. So, so that's, that's the, ch- it's, it's a very fun project. We might be using some interesting technology. We're in discussions now to get into the financing stages. So limo is in the works. Um, yeah, so these are the three projects right now that are really on my plate. And there's a couple of other projects, like always, you know, always in development yeah. and, sure. and ready to, to, to go. But we'll see one step at a time. You know, with COVID, it's very difficult to say what the next step is because of uh, the delays and, and you know, uh, the whole, just the, biz, the world of film right now, you know. So yeah, I got to be, you know, I'm being very patient and uh, hopefully Hall will, will do well in festivals. And I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to lead to great things. It's yeah. played at Fright Fest. Yes, this 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 coming August twenty eighth, I believe. Right, and then are, are, is there plans for uh, VODs, so, or is that be worked mm-hmm. out right now? That is on the works right now. So right okay. now we're negotiating. We're going to negotiate some distribution deals. So you'll definitely get to see it on uh, VOD or uh, probably Bell or you know we're just working the details. We're still not there yet. We just wanted to you know finish the film and yeah get fright get fright fest you know out there get a, get get the first festival and then we'll finalize our deals but definitely you'll get to see it somewhere in the next six months hopefully all right i look forward to it thank you very much thank you